The most remarkable innovations often emerge not from years or even decades of deliberate effort for a specific goal. Sometimes, through coincidence or improvisation, the most significant breakthroughs result from creations initially unsuitable for their intended purpose, but perfect for another. The Hawker Siddeley Nimrod Maritime Patrol aircraft stands as a prime example. Crafted through modifications to the ill-fated inaugural commercial jetliner globally, this aircraft evolved into one of history's most iconic military jets. So how did a failed commercial aircraft end up becoming an iconic military jet? Now, before we go into how the Nimrod and its variants cemented their spot in military aviation history, we need to first learn about the aircraft that inspired it all, the de Havilland DH-106 Comet. You see, just before the end of World War II, the Cabinet of the United Kingdom set up a committee to determine the type of airliner that would take advantage of the new technologies and boost air transport in the UK. They wanted a pressurised transatlantic mail plane with a payload of at least one tonne and cruising speed of up to 400 miles per hour. De Havilland, as an aviation company, was interested and proposed a specification for a pure turbojet-powered aircraft, and this was quite unique. Because back then, they proposed the development of the then unpopular jet engines. You see, the turbojet engines were still unpopular, as most planes were built using a prop engine. Back then, Germany was basically the only country that even experimented with jet engines, like, for instance, the Heinkel HE 280, while the rest of the world was still using prop engines. However, this all changed after World War II, but it wasn't going to be easy. You see, De Havilland had to design and develop both the engines and airframes themselves as the complete process was too advanced for engine and aircraft manufacturers at the time. Nonetheless, their proposal was accepted, and despite all the risks involved from creating such an aircraft from scratch, the DH-106 was passed for production and ready to test. On the 27th of July, 1949, the first de Havilland DH-106 Comet prototype took to the skies for the first time in a 31-minute long flight. The prototype was a quadjet powered with four Ghost 50 Mark I engines that could carry over 40 passengers and, according to the seating configuration, had a maximum takeoff weight of over 48 tonnes. After its approval by the British Aviation Authorities, it officially became the world's first commercial jetliner when it was introduced with the British Overseas Airways Corporation, or BOAC, on the 2nd of May 1952. However, all the excitement for the aircraft quickly turned into dismay, as a series of hull loss accidents and fatal crashes occurred soon after its introduction, leading to the loss of 492 lives in just a few years. It was so bad that there had to be an emergency worldwide grounding, which took them off the skies for over four years as necessary design modifications were made. But even after the modifications, the aircraft still proved to be problematic and pilot errors led to five further crashes from the Comet 4, which was supposed to be the variant that would put all its troubles behind it. After the third iteration of the Comet 4, the 4C was developed and still faced multiple issues. Its successor, the Comet 5, had its development plans shelved and de Havilland discontinued the Comet project. Many felt this was the end of the road for the development of the Comet jets, and indeed it was supposed to be after so many accidents and fatalities. However, this wasn't exactly the case. To everyone's surprise, the aircraft was afforded a fresh chance to be useful in another form when the British Royal Air Force requested for a maritime patrol aircraft to replace their fleet of aging Avro Shackleton aircrafts in June 1964. So how was this failed commercial aircraft able to fulfil the requirements for military purposes? Well, you see, despite all the concerns with the Comet, it was still mostly uncharted territory, and there seemed to be some underlying acceptance that the accidents were consequences of necessary innovation, and that any manufacturer that made the bold foray first would have still faced the same. So when de Havilland decided to discontinue the Comet, Hawker Siddeley, a successor firm, decided to make advancements to the last two 4C aircraft produced. They ended up designing a maritime patrol version of the aircraft in accordance with the demands of the Royal Air Force and called it the HS-801. 
Competing with aircraft such as the Lockheed P-3 Orion, the Breguet Atlantic, and the Vickers VC-10, the HS-801 emerged as the preferred choice for the Royal Air Force in February 1965, when the then Prime Minister announced plans to order Hawker Siddeley's maritime patrol version of the Comet. At last, after a decade of issues, the newly improved Comet, or rather HS-801, was a success. The HS-801 was eventually called the Hawker Siddeley Nimrod, as we know it today, with its first two prototypes being built from the two final 4C airframes, which were unfinished at the time. Now, Hawker Siddeley made some big changes to the 4C, notably replacing the turbojet engines with Rolls-Royce Spey turbofans for improved fuel efficiency, especially at low altitudes. Fuselage upgrades were also made to include an internal weapons bay, a new tail with electronic warfare sensors, an extended nose for radar, and eventually a magnetic anomaly detector or otherwise called mad boom. If you don't know what a mad boom is, then I don't blame you, so let me quickly explain it for you. The mad boom is a detector that detects variations in the Earth's magnetic field. This was particularly handy to identify submarines, now, as you can imagine, these upgrades changed the aircraft from an unsteady and barely controllable commercial plane to a very functional and sturdy maritime patrol jet. And it paid off. The Royal Air Force was satisfied with what they saw after the first flight and made 46 orders of the aircraft. By October 1969, the first iteration of the Nimrod MR1, called the XV-230, had entered into service becoming the first jet-powered military patrol aircraft to do so. The performance of the Nimrods were more highlighted in their capabilities for military operations rather than pure specifications. Three of the MR1s were adapted to perform the signal's intelligence role, to gather intelligence by intercepting signals. The MR1 weren't actually equipped with the Mad Boom, but it had an array of rotating dish aerials in its bomb bay and non-rotating ones in its tail cone, and at the front of the wing-mounted fuel tank. It also had a four-man flight crew and could have as much as 25 crew members controlling the operations of internal equipment. From 1975, some of the MR1 aircraft saw an upgrade to MR2 standard. This upgrade saw a considerable modernization of the aircraft's electronic systems with changes made to a lot of existing systems these changes included the replacement of ASV Mark 21 radars, which were found on the MR1s with the EMI Searchwater radar, the addition of a new acoustic processor, which could handle modern sonobuoys, a new mission data recorder and new electronic support measures. Provision for in-flight refueling was also introduced a bit further down the line as a response to demands during the Falklands War. And it didn't stop there as different situations of conflict led to further modifications being added to the aircraft to deal with new threats or difficult terrain. The Nimrod MR2 was tasked with three main roles, which were anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface unit warfare and search and rescue. And though its range might have been around 4,500 to 5,000 nautical miles, its in-flight refueling capabilities allowed it to achieve much longer flights. Furthermore, its turbofan engines also gave it an advantage when it comes to speed and altitude capabilities, making it more equipped to evade detection by submarines. Not bad for a jet that was once considered a failed airplane. Now, the Nimrods possessed great endurance for that time, as they were able to fly for 10 hours without needing an aerial refuel. They were also able to run on just two of the four available engines, meaning that engines could be operated much more efficiently and this probably led to their relatively long lifespan for over four decades. And the two hydraulic systems on board were also designed to be powered by any combination of the two engines which are running, which is genius, because that meant that the MR2 wasn't dependable on certain engines. It only needs two engines to keep it flying. As you might know by now, the Nimrods provided a great leap in navigation, weapons control, enemy detection and other capabilities, which greatly enhanced Britain's military performance whenever they were called upon. They created a legacy for the Royal Air Force with the numerous successful operations they aided. And though there were some accidents, the general consensus was of an aircraft that left a positive long-term impact on military aviation. 
Despite the numerous troubles of the aircraft it descended from, the Nimrod ended up being the dominant maritime patrol aircraft for over four decades. Its iconic design and innovative performance capabilities put it well ahead of the competition, at least in the eyes of the Royal Air Force. However, it is important to note that the support of the British government might have given them the upper hand as there's a possibility that one of the other aircrafts that were offered could have ended up doing the same job or even better with support. But whether this was the case or not, the fact remains that the Nimrod served its role perfectly. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, and the Nimrod MR1 and 2 were expected to be replaced by an extensive remodification called the MRA4. However, issues such as cost overruns, long delays and financial cutbacks meant plans for the aircraft had to be shelved in 2010. Another variant called the Nimrod AEW3, which was a dedicated airborne early warning platform, was also shelved way back in 1986 for almost similar reasons. In June 2011, the last flight of a Nimrod MR1 took place in the Royal Air Force Base in Waddington, over a year after the MR2 had completed its final official flight in an evacuation training exercise. And by July 2011, all the available Nimrod aircraft variants had been retired, with the R1 expected to be replaced by the ex-United States Air Force Boeing 135W rivet joint. So there you have it, a commercial aircraft which was plagued by several accidents somehow became a revolutionary military patrol aircraft. This could serve proof that sometimes a creation has the right design, but is just being used in the wrong environment. But what do you think? Please share your thoughts in the comments below.